why me, Lord? What have I ever done to deserve even one of the pleasures I've known? Tell me, Lord, what did I ever do that was worth loving you for the kindness you've shown? Lord, help me, Jesus, I'm wasted it so. morning is based off 1 Peter 4, verses 7 through 11. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God, very peak grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate so much the talents that God gives and those who take those talents and work with them. Judy and I got to see Alex Friday night as he was at the play at the Hayesville School campus, it's called, but it's in Hayesville. And then last night we traveled south and we saw Karina and Alyssa uh, playing like ducks. Uh, in uh, their play at the Bell Plain High School. And uh, once again, just excited to see you guys uh, taking on these challenges and allowing us to just enjoy uh, for a few moments. This morning, I want to share with you a story about a, uh, a, a, a lady. A church had had, their, had a mission family at their church and they were then given the opportunity to give a, a love offering. And uh, to prepare the church, they decided, if you're not prepared this morning, he said, we'll take, just write on a piece of paper what you intend to give. And uh, some people would call that a pledge, others would call that a, a love uh, offering or a faith promise or something like this. But anyway, this one elderly lady who was a regular participant in the church she pledged one dollar 
as she put that piece of paper in the offering plate. And that afternoon, as the people responsible for counting the money and making sure it's deposited correctly, they were going through counting the offering and then counting the faith promises or the pledges, whatever terminology is comfortable for you. And they noticed this one lady had made the pledge of one dollar. One of the men that was there says, well, I know that woman. She, she washes clothes for my wife. She, she's not able to pay this money. So the man took a dollar out of his pocket and put it in the envelope and marked her faith promise or her pledge as, as paid. However, two weeks later, this, this lady came to the church to pay her faith promise. The pastor informed her, well, your, your, your faith promise has already been paid. And the widow, the widow insisted, said, it has not been paid because I still have the money in my pocket. She stated that she had saved 10 cents out of each load of washing that she had done for the past two weeks. And that now she had the money to pay the pledge. And finally, the pastor told her about the man who had paid her pledge for her. Tears came to her eyes, perhaps not for the reason you might think. Tears came to her eyes, and she made this statement that that pastor has recorded for people like me to read. She said, the work of the Lord goes forward. The gospel is preached. Souls are saved. But I have no part in it. I think sometimes we think because I can't put a hundred dollar bill or a thousand dollar bill that I don't count. This lady grasped a truth. She worked hard. She plotted and planned carefully because she desperately wanted to be a part of the ministry of that missionary. The bottom line is that woman deserved, she had a right to have a part. Every person that's born again, every saved man, woman, and child needs to have a part every week in the Lord's work. That's the whole principle of stewardship. It's what I do with what I have, whether it's minuscule or magnanimous. Paul had an important word for us. It's recorded in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He says, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Then he goes on and says, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. If you've been taught the gospel we have an incurring responsibility to teach others the gospel. The apostle Peter put it this way in chapter 4, verse 10. He said, as each, or each person, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Let's take a look at this whole principle of being a channel of grace. The Lord has given you the resources to be a blessing. He has gifted us differently, but he has gifted us. Now this morning I want each of you to look at that portion of scripture that says, as each man or as each person has received a gift, you have something to offer in God's service. For instance, it's our privilege to have a nursery and people who have a love and a passion for the babies to care for them for a, a little while while mom and dad are participating in the worship service. For those of us that our children have long since grown and left home and have families of their own, we still remember what it was like to always be tired, 
full of love and appreciation, but wanting a chance just to be with adults, <laughs> other adults for a little while. How about Tots Church? How about Kids Church? How about youth groups? How about food service to others? Oh my goodness, <laughs> we have our Thanksgiving dinner tonight. Do you think that's not a grace? Some of you have unique, dynamic talents in this regard. And some of us have a tremendous ability to enjoy it. My mom was one of those that, if you wanted to insult her, is don't eat her cooking. And if you wanted to insult her, pass on seconds. She loved to cook, excellent cook. My dad and my younger brother and I, we both not only survived her cooking, we thrived on her cooking. Most of us can cook, but there are those who can really cook. There's so many things to be done around the church and to folk in our church and in the community and your neighbors where you live. I don't mean you always have to be doing something every moment of the day. I'm just simply saying, don't you understand that sometimes that ability that you have is God's means by using you to bless other people. Caring to invite others to Jesus caring to enable more ministry, just sharing in the life of the church. You know what an encouragement that is. I, I've, I've, been, I've, I've, I've preached once in a church where there was one person present. It was on the other side of the mountains from the church I'd been preaching at, but every other Sunday I'd go over there and preach. And it was a very remote community and I believe our high attendance was nine, but the low attendance one day was one. And so we talked for a while, and it was apparent no one else was coming, and I said, well, do you want to just talk or you want to have church? And he says, son, I was young then. He says, son, I come here for church. How about you? So we backed up, and we sang our songs, and I preached the sermon, and we had church. He didn't think the sermon needed to be that long. <laughs> but we had church. And you know something? That was in uh, 1962, I believe. And I still remember that. What a blessing to share in that very special moment. Loving other people, just that handshake or that arm around the shoulder and just an encourage. You see, the, the word gift that's in your text this morning, the word gift from the expanded meaning in the original language means gift of grace. I, I understand why sometimes you don't think of yourself as being a channel of grace from God to others. You're just being you. What I want to encourage you this morning is please pick up the larger vision. Know how to encourage. Be willing to share. Be willing to pass on a blessing. For God will use you to meet a need in another person's life, and you may never know what that need is. They may never come to you and say what a difference you made because you cared enough to say, hey, how's it going? but you were being used of God. I put up four passages of scripture. It's also printed in the back of your bulletin. I'll let you look that up if you are so inclined later on. I just want to encourage you to understand that your abilities are God-given. Ephesians 2.8, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. I am fascinated by good mechanics. Now, I've worked on trucks and tanks when I was in the army. I 
worked on my own cars through the years. I've pulled engines. I've rebuilt some stuff. But I'm not a mechanic, you know? I'm not a good mechanic. Uh, I usually have to redo my work. But there are those who can hear something, an engine run or a transmission whirl, and you can hear something and you know what it is. And people like me just love to come by you and, and say, can you help me out? Not everyone has that gift, that ability. You say, well, anyone can turn a wrench. Yes, and I've broken off bolts by twisting too hard. Or I've rounded bolts because I didn't put the wrench on securely. You see what I'm saying? We all can do stuff, but there are those who are uniquely gifted. You can say, well, yeah, I've trained. I've been doing it all my life, but I'm going to say something about you. Part of that is also God's gift. There's an intuitiveness within you that most of us do not have. Whether it's the cooking, whether it is the working on a vehicle, whether it is teaching a Sunday school lesson, whether it's encouraging the children, whether it's being a blessing to those who are sick and needing that encouragement and comfort. See, God does not give his grace for the sole enjoyment of the recipient. The, the giftedness that you have, it is for the purpose of being a blessing to others. Not just for you to hold on to and how good I am. The basic frailty of human nature is that too often we wish to do as little as possible to get as much as possible. The, the true Christian spirit, however, is to put more into life than you take out. To serve others so that your life will be a channel through which God's grace blesses others. Peter indicated that we're responsible to ministering those blessings to others. The, the word minister in the original language is where we get the word deacon. I don't know what you think about a deacon is, but the word deacon simply means to minister, to serve. Literally, at the you know, a deacon is not a perfect person. Now, there are some examples, some encouragement, some standards that are set, yes, but their purpose was to serve so that others could be free to serve in their areas. The Lord also expects you to be a channel of His grace. In our text, again, the words, even so, minister. I want us to look in our Christian life with this concept of, Lord, how, how do you want to use me? Paul stated our case when he wrote in Romans 1.11, he says, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. He, he really wanted to be a blessing to those folk in Rome. Concerning our responsibilities to being a channel of grace, I want to just I want to pour scripture into you. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse nineteen and twenty. Paul said, "In Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against Him, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation." Now look here; He says, "God making His appeal through us." We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God, in dealing with people, wants to use people, us. Jesus said, it's recorded in John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus says, peace be unto you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And then in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, the fact that we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. The bottom line is, if we don't share the gospel, who will? Angels can't. Do you know that? Angels are not permitted. The, the dead can't. 
They are at rest waiting for the glories of the general resurrection. The only ones who can share the gospel are people like, like us. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through him. It's the blood that Jesus shed that satisfies for my sin when I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. We need to remember that we will one day give an account on how we have lived our lives in God's service. I've shared stories before you in previous times that we've shared of individuals who've done what would be perceived as menial tasks but did it faithfully for an extended and protracted period of time. And when they did pass away, when they did die, those in their sphere of influence began to realize of what a tremendous blessing that person had been to them. That person had been a channel of God's grace to them. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2, this is how one should regard us. Regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. My encouragement to you, the Lord also wants you to be a good steward. Not just a steward, but a good steward. Steward. Now the word good in its expanded meanings means basically that which is intrinsically good, fair, and beautiful. You may not consider yourself as being of significance, but when God uses you to be a blessing to someone else, can I encourage you that you are being looked upon with admiration, appreciation. They may not see the scars the imperfections that seem to haunt you when you look in the mirror in the morning. What they see is someone who loved me enough to care. Someone who cared enough to share. Someone who allowed God to use them to be a blessing to you. Stewardship, understood in its broadest sense, cannot be limited to the responsible management of your material possessions. Stewardship is life-oriented, not one particular topic. The wise and dedicated stewardship of possessions is, is a verification of your, of your participation in that total stewardship. But if you really believe that we're to be stewards and not owners, then the whole face of Christianity would be changed. Then there would be people and money more than enough for all causes around the world. One of the great blessings there has been a couple decades, a couple centuries ago in England, the missionaries that poured out of England traveling around the world in those little rinky-dink sailboats. One missionary took him nine months of sailing I was on one of those little tiny boats down in the, crossing the Caribbean from Haiti over to an island about 11 miles away. <laughs> and I envision that as being like a boat of the old days, just the clapboards going around and rags soaked and wrapped in tar in between the boards. And one man's job of the crew on the boat was pumping the water out of the bottom of the boat. And here you are, when you're out in the middle, I'm five and a half miles either way, and I maybe could swim a half mile one way. One guy's job was to pull the boat, to pull the water out of the boat. I was thankful for him. In the late 1800s and predominantly the 1900s, it was America sending missionaries around the world. We've almost quit that. 
as our society has turned away from God more and more. When we have more than enough for our own needs, more, more I, I've literally had parents tell me that they did not want their children involved in our youth groups, did not want their children sharing at church camp because they were afraid their kids would do what? Become missionaries. And I'll never see them again. <laughs> Life happens. Judy and I have been blessed with four kids. I'm sorry, Judy, I've lost track of how many grandkids, 18 maybe, more than that of their children. Some of them I've never, never seen because they live so far away. Not, not missionaries, but serving the Lord where they are, but I don't get to see them. The real, the real truth of the matter is, folks, as we are blessed to have our children and to work, to train our children and lead them into adulthood, is a lot of times they're going to move a long way from you. Don't be afraid of God. I am not saying that in order to be a good Christian, you've got to be a missionary. It's not my point. My point is when we have thrown roadblocks up, that when God wants to use you or your children to be a channel of blessing to others that might be a long way away, don't you think he will give you the grace and the power and the ability to still have that contact? Don't you understand that it used to be when a missionary went off the foreign field, letters would take months? When I served in the army, I was living in Germany, and I would write my wife back here in the States. It commonly took one to two weeks for a letter to get across. Do you know what we do now? We turn the computer on. And that little tiny button on the top of your computer... It's a camera. I had a missionary friend of mine in Africa, and I was on his, the American division of, of the board for his mission work. So once a year, by law, we had to have a meeting. Well, were we going to go there, or is he going to come here? Neither. We turned on the computer, and we had our meeting face-to-face -face <coughs> through the computer with Skype. And we conducted the business of the mission that needed to be done to satisfy the government inquiries of Tanzania and of America. I mean, you can stay in touch literally around the world. Don't be so afraid of what God will require. If he's going to use you as a channel of blessing to others, do you think he doesn't know of your emotional heartbeat? of your passion for your own family. <clears throat> I want to close out with a story that was published in 1939. That seemed like a long time ago, and it was published in, in a newspaper in Berlin, in Nazi Germany. The little poem went this way. We have captured all the positions, and on the heights we have planted the banners. You had imagined that was all that we wanted. We want more. We want it all. Your hearts are our goal. It is your soul we want. You may not be sympathetic to the cause of the Nazis, but there is a world out there that is wanting your soul. They are wanting your heart. They're wanting your passion. They're wanting your focus. 
your enthusiasm, your energy. And you know what? It will never, ever be satisfied. No matter how much you give to the world, they will always want more. But when you, when you lay yourself at the foot of the cross, Lord Jesus, would you save me? Would you forgive me of my sins? He says, I'll not only forgive you of your sins, but I will impart to you the Holy Spirit so that you will have the power, you will have the ability, and I'll extend to you the grace to do what I desire for you to do. What does he desire for you to do? Love your kids, train your kids, cook a meal, fix a car, lead somebody to the Lord, realize that there's a world hurting out there. When you saw on the news what happened last Sunday, was your first thought fear? Or faith? Did you talk about them or did you pray for them? When needs are brought to our attention, our first response ought to be prayer. Because God has people already in position to meet needs. You may be that person, or it might well be someone else. But God knows what's going on. So we choose not to live in fear. We choose to live in faith. And we will continue to be faithful. Even whenever it appears on all sides that no one really appreciates us or cares about us. Or loves us. We'll continue to pray. We'll continue to serve. We'll continue to share God's love. And the sweet message of the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay, guys? Let's let that be the focus. You are, you are a channel of God's blessing. Would you stand with me, please? Father, I know the government wants our, our hearts, our soul. They want everything about us. No matter what government or style it is, people seem to crave power over others. Father, I thank you that you have the power and you desire to demonstrate your power through us. So, Father, this morning I'm asking you in the precious name of Jesus to speak to each heart here. I know there's struggles going on. I know there's grief and I know there's hurt. Father, I give you all praise and glory. And I'm asking you right now that we might be a people who would just simply bless you and participate in you be a blessing to others through us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.